Hello, everybody. I'm Cody. And I'm Brent. And we are the Hugo Knots here to review and discuss for you the best sci fi novels of all time. This week, right now, Peter Watts' Blind Sight. Make sure you like, subscribe, download, follow, however you listen to us, um, so you don't miss next episode, which is an interview with Becky Chambers, the author behind the Hugo Award winning Wave, the Wayfarer, the Wayfarers series, um, and she is an awesome hope punk science fiction writer, uh, very happy, positive writing, and uh, you could feel it. You could feel it all over the place. We're excited about that one. But right now, again, Blind Sight by Peter Watts, which is one of the internet's favorite novels. It feels like, yeah, uh, and for good reason. This blew our minds. Okay, so here's the setup. Um, uh, first off, this book is, it's like a medium length, I would say, 384 pages, uh, 11 hours, 45 minutes on audiobook. And the setup is right off the bat, aliens take a picture of the entire planet down to one meter of resolution. And we know that because the way they did it is they let the entire sky on fire over the entire planet Earth. Everybody saw it. Real crazy. Um, soon thereafter, we detected something on the very edge of the solar system, something sending a signal, but it's not sending it to us, it's sending it out away, either to another star or towards something that's already coming toward Earth. So they send a ship uh, with five people on it, um, including two technical specialists whose brains have been radically altered to let them do all kinds of crazy interfacing with machines and experience senses that we don't have. Um, a resurrected vampire who directly interfaces with the AI of the ship and is the commander. And then uh, a soldier and then our main character, our protagonist, Siri, who is a, uh, a synthesist whose job is to understand what these radically altered people are saying and be able to communicate it back to Earth to tell them what they find as they get out into the dark among the stars. And that's the setup. They find something, obviously. I guess I'll say that in the setup also. Otherwise, it would be a boring <laughs> a boring book. They do find something. It's very exciting. And Spoiler anyway, free. Let's get into it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I rated this book a five out of five. It's one of the best books I've read in a long time. Um, I was hooked and stayed hooked and then just mind blown uh, left and right. It's just a very complex narrative about extraterrestrial encounters. Um, it comes at it in a very, from a very novel direction. I haven't seen a lot like it or anything like it really. Um, the revelations this book has. Um, and it also has a lot of just on the side, interesting stuff about the, the future of bioengineering humans and upload and it's one of those novels that's just so detailed um, that all of these things that Peter Watts just kind of blasts by, flies by, could be their own novel. Like the, it's very dense uh, and amazing. For sure. What you, yeah, what, gonna, what, do you, what do you what do you think? I'm gonna give it a four out of five. Um, unbelievably compelling idea about how consciousness works, and it's like such a unique book about aliens. Um, but so much more than that too. Uh, some, some bits of it feel a little bit clunky, but I will say in the end it, it all comes together and it all like achieved what it was meant to achieve. So you just gotta like push through the, your confusion, push through, you know, if there's little sections that like kind of annoy you, whatever, just keep moving, keep moving. It's going to come together and it's going to going to blow your mind. On that note, um, we're doing our usual no spoilers, but at the end of this episode, we are going to do a, a spoiler section where we talk about the big crazy thing that happens and this crazy idea. So we have a chance to like, you know, we can all, we can all think about that. Um, so anyway, well, we, as usual, we'll do that after similar books to recommend. We'll make it very clear we're about to do that, but we will not give away the big thing. Obviously they find some aliens, but we're not going to like get into the thing the, or wait, anyway, some, yes, that's or the deal. even some of the smaller things. We won't give those away either. Um, <laughs> but you were right that this book like just throws you right into the deep end, right? Like right off the bat, um, you you're like, 
middle narrative and just go. Um, I feel like a a a good um, kind of comparison to what you were saying about let it wash over you is I feel like that happens with uh, like Nolan films sometimes where you're just like, all right, you just yeah. you just gotta watch. And let it happen and decide later if you like it or yeah, maybe Grandma, you'll don't figure ask it out me questions. Just trust. It will make sense. Yeah. Well, you know, some yes, some no, if we're talking about Nolan. But here, yes. Here is a here is a good example of that working out. It almost it, the other thing that it reminded me of was um it's almost like a like a video game tutorial in a really in the best possible way where you're actually already playing the game and the story's happening and it's fun and it's engaging um, and you don't realize you're learning the controls and improving at it but the game is like almost tricking you into into learning its its ways its its complexities under the surface um, and that's how this book feels because at, at face value it, it is dense there's a lot of science a lot of ideas a lot is happening um and then as you as you you know brook forward uh you you find out that you really needed to intuitively understand all those things i yeah for it I totally to really agree. it's like priming you so that when you get to the reveal you're ready to see like all the radical implications and what it means about how you think about uh, lots of things, no spoilers, but yeah, so, so, so good. Interesting... It primes you perfectly. Yeah. So it can hit you in an interesting narrative way instead of like a scientific paper or something where you have to think about it more. It hits you in an intuitive level at an intuitive level. Um, it's also kind of scary. Yeah, it's kind of scary. I, I agree. It, it's, it's, uh, I'm not generally like a huge horror person, but this, there's a bunch of sections of this that like do horror so well and it fits really it well and with the style where like it's just overwhelming it's sometimes kind of hard to tell what's happening doesn't seem like it's going well you don't know what's going to be around that next corner and it just feels foreboding and it feels like there's no way they're going to be able to figure this out or deal with this situation and it's um yeah it's a very it's a vibe for sure uh, a, a <laughs> yeah. good very strong creeping horror situation and 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 the and psychological thriller too um and that the mix of the science fiction works really well with it because it's like scientifically explained why like the scientific explanation is adding to the horror of it <laughs> um yeah for sure so it's cool it's very unique in that way um and then really, you know, as far as characters go, we have uh, all the ones you listed as well as some, some people back on Earth. Um, but really, we're here for our narrator, Siri. Um, he is mod a modified human. He um, find out what happens to him at the beginning um, of his life at the beginning of the novel. Um, but he's like, he's definitely the right narrator for the story because his his kind of purpose as a synthesis as you talked about is to um bridge the gap between kind of regular humans us the audience and our surrogates in the story um and the highly modified and advanced humans who really just don't communicate or have the same kind of drives that regular humans do so it's a cool narration um N narrator perspective to get to explain what it might be like to be around um, people who we don't have anything in common with and can't even understand really. Yeah, I will say he is for, you know, going in, if you haven't read this book, um, one of the things you need to know is that like he is not a likable main character. You're not going to enjoy him right. or like think he's a particularly good person. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that he, as you said, he's the right like narrator for this story and um, makes the sort of the, 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 the big revelation hit in, in a really powerful way. But yeah, he's not a likable guy. Um, and uh, as a particular example of that, there's a bunch of, of sort of flashbacks to his relationship with this, this woman, Chelsea. Um, and a lot of them are very, tough like verging on like a little like the dialogue is like cringy and and some of that is it's uh, 
I would say some of it's just end, cringy, and some of yeah, it's, some of it's like just, he's he's self described as a sociopath who sees human beings as systems to be figured out. So there's like yeah, but whereas there there are a little bit of like a blurred line between like is it just kind of cringy or is it like cringy for a purpose? Yeah, in the end, I would say I I didn't. If you'd asked me like a half or three quarters of the way through the book how I felt about their relationship, I would say like, man, I hated that. I wish they had just cut all those parts. In the end, I see why it was there. I think it did help achieve the purpose, but it was still my least favorite part of the book for sure. Um, but it was, well, there were there's... other things. I mean, there were things about it that were interesting and really wild about like what, you know, a future relationship could be like in this world where, you know, they're tinkering with their brains in all these different ways. Um so anyway, yeah. And there's a couple great, you know, with his with his his uh parents and with Chelsea, like with with his other human uh friends and family characters, there are a couple of great, like really just great literary uh points that Watts makes and just like blows by. Like there's just, you know, you'll get in the middle of a chapter, you'll get something, you're like, oh my god, that's so true about the human experience. And that could be like that if if yeah, it's not uh, even the imprinted. point of the thing that he's doing. It's just like a side note. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. and and it could yeah, like I said earlier, it could just it could be a whole novel itself. But he's just like yeah, it's in there, and then you know we're we're moving on, um, which makes it one of those like great novels in my opinion. It's a, th those kind of details, um, and yeah, I mean let's talk about why don't you tell us about like the upload and the, the bioengineered humans? Um, because yeah, it is a, interesting a, a, in that it's like those, half the book is like, yeah, that, there's a bunch then... of this that's explored in pretty, in pretty good detail in general, this idea of like, what will humanity become as we start to sort of change ourselves more and more is, um, very interesting. There's certainly parts of it that don't seem appealing. I don't think Peter Watts is trying to say it's a bad thing. I think he's just trying to think about what could happen and sort of lay it out for us to make our own judgments. Um, and yeah, some of the ideas are super bizarre and interesting. Um, really liked the, that idea a lot. I think his point is almost that we can't moralize about it because if we're like, we're maybe we're going to do it inevitably, but if we do, it, we're going to be so different that we won't really have the same kind of outlook on life. So it's not, it doesn't matter. There's no reason to think that we, we need to moralize on it as humans. We are now because we'd be different humans in this scenario. We yeah, care about different sure. things. Yeah. Um, there's also, got aliens. Um, yeah, we've got, yeah, of course, the aliens half, are a big part obviously. of it. <laughs> Um, there's also uh, consciousness uploading, which is one of those things that's just sort of an aside, but could be a much bigger, uh, a much bigger thing. But there's some interesting ways that's explored and how those people who've uploaded sort of like have very different concerns than the people who are still living in the world. Um, and um, there's so much more, but I think that's like some of the most important high level sort of interesting stuff he's, he's pointing out. Yeah, and that again is just kind of happening. It's not the main uh, narrative arc. It's just the world he's built, and he's he's added a lot of these cool details. And um, I had forgotten you hadn't done upload yet, so my uh, my segue to aliens is now happening right now. There's aliens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, there are. Yeah, it's this is a really good first contact book. Um, I think. Uh, uh, one of my favorite first contact books for sure explores it in such a different way. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, um, and, what about and the, points it back, other, it like, points it back at us, which we'll talk more about in the post spoiler section, but it, I haven't seen a first contact book. That's purpose is to like point at something about human nature. That's so fundamental and be like, well, what do you think about it? If we view it like this? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. What about the uh, science and tech? There's also a bunch of like other science and technology ideas that sort of happen throughout the book too. Yeah. Um, tons of stuff. I mean, it's one of those books that uh, when, when hard science fiction is done right. And, and at least when I, when I really enjoy it and when I, I, I my opinion is it's done really well, it's done right. It's something that is kind of teaching you concepts at, at a level where the they're explaining it well enough so that you can be along for the narrative, but not in so much detail that you're bored, 
but also I love reading uh, hard sci-fi books where I'm like, wait, I want to look that up now. I want to learn more about this. I want to learn more about this. And this book had tons of that. I mean, just for example, you had um, the cic- like saccade visual, the way that our eyes track movement um, or track uh, what we focus on. I looked into saccades a lot after reading this. Uh, Necker cube, um, which I didn't, it's that 3D cube that you have to look at one way and then the other to tell that it's 3D. It's the drawing, the two-dimensional drawing of a 3D object. Um, I didn't realize that there, I didn't know that was the term for that. Um, just those are some random things I wrote down, but yeah, I really liked the Icarus array, which is like the way they power their ship, uh, with antimatter, basically I'll I'll save it for the book, but the short version is like, this is his solution to how do you, uh, have like a, a ship capable of interstellar travel. And his answer is, um, you keep sending it the fuel while it's already in flight, which is a very cool idea. Um, and there's just there's all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so anyway, we could do so many more science tech ideas, but those are some of the ones that just sort of jumped out. Right. Um, and then there's one that's a little bit, uh, there's there's a couple of yeah. things that tripped us up about this this one. Um, this is one of them. Uh, Yuka Sars, uh, Sarasti or Sarasti is the, um, the vampire who is brought back to life as the um in between the go between between the ship's ai and the rest of the humans and the 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 idea is that you know a vampire think he's he just wanted to insert like apex predator and then use the archetype to like communicate that in an effective manner um and it kind of works but the idea is that uh, saristi is the smartest of the smart um and so can talk to an ai at an ai level but then kind of communicate with um, the humans, uh, so he can run things, but I didn't really think he needed to be a vampire. And that was just kind of confusing. Like I couldn't tell if it was a metaphor, like we, we'd made a, we'd made vampires genetically based off like the archetypal legend of the vampire, or if there was an literal vampire that was brought back to life all of a sudden in this hard science fiction universe. Yeah. Unclear. And I agree not in the end, it didn't feel necessary. It was what it was. It was that was one of the few things where I got to the end and I was like, okay, I suspended my disbelief the whole time. Like, did it pay off? And I was like, oh, I'm actually not sure on that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, it didn't like take away from the book if you just like keep moving past it. It's not the main point, but yeah, it did feel like, oh, there's vampires and we're just gonna like not right. talk about it. Okay, which I guess is a, a spoiler in in a way, but I don't feel like it's a like. No, you know it's a vampire a spoiler. Right up front. I guess we're yeah. spoiling that it never gets fixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which I think I would have liked to know while I was reading it. Um, and it's cool if you just take it at face value. I mean, he's he's scary and cool. I like Saristi's character. He adds to the the spookiness. For sure, um, his character actually is good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so ultimately uh what makes this book so stand out so much um other than all these other details is that it's an incredibly complicated idea as we've said 900 times um the 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 big reveal at the end um and teaching us along the way how to how to come to this revelation um watts does it brilliantly uh, he does it through different literary techniques. Like we have like voice switching. That's cool. We see, you know, we get a lot of second person moments of Siri, the character who we're nor- normally seeing in third person limited. And then also through, um, some of the AI of like the probes they've sent out and at other various moments. Um, and that, that switching to you really, uh, he brings you in at the right moments to make you feel like that thing um when he wants you to f- feel like that thing and and the, the the way he where he chooses to do it um makes a lot of sense in the end and helps you helps you get the uh the reveal and helps it just like sink in instinctually instinct yeah it's a huge awesome payoff it's one of those books there as you're going like is this all going to come together and it does um so yeah, what else? Uh, what else do you think is is like this? If if people like Blindsight, what else should they be reading? Why don't you start? Because you you got a the first one here. 
Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll do uh, The Moat in God's Eye by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell, um, which is uh, uh, another first contact book that I really love. Um, similarly, with a really good twist. It's, um, I would say, not as like hard sci fi. It's not like, you know, you don't feel like you need to look things up along the way, but uh, similarly, like great payoff, good adventure story. It's just fun, great first contact book. So, yeah. Um, I chose Children of Ruin by Adrian Tchaikovsky, um, the successor to Children of Time, which we've reviewed on the podcast before, um, which both are just amazing books. Children of Ruin is the only kind of contact alien life extraterrestrial um, novel that I think has a thematic similarity with um, Blind Sight, and it's just a great book. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'll close this off with, I guess, another another second book in the series, but uh, The Dark Forest <laughs> by Cijun Liu, yeah. the sequel to Three-Body Problem. Um, Blindside is not, like, as... Blindside's kind of bleak, too. They're both dark... Forests. ...stories about interacting with aliens and, you know, maybe things aren't so friendly out there and... Um, and similarly, like, full of, of tech ideas. I think I like Blindside actually even a little more. Um... It's also a lot shorter, which is nice. But anyway, yeah, uh, uh, so definitely gave a similar like overall feeling. Uh, and the revelation yeah. of Dark Forest too, like that the, the yes. idea, the way it hits is like, I mean, one of those, an, another one of those books where you kind of like can't think about the universe quite in the same way after you've read it. It like really changes the way you think about a lot of things um, at a, at a, low level um and yeah i mean you just three body comes back all the time but here we are in the circle the three body circle once again i mean we're doing first contact books so yeah it's gonna happen right yeah, um, exactly all right well so if you books. uh don't want to hear about the, 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 the end of this book and um sort of the big thing they find uh turn away now um if you are interested Let's do it. Let's talk about this big idea in Blindsight. So we'll give you one second. Get out Three, of here. Two. Scary vampires coming. One. All right. Why don't you tell us, Brent, why don't we just do a quick overview of how the aliens work, how the aliens, they interact, what we find out. Yeah. So they get out to this... Um, there's like a an almost like a proto sun, a very large planet that is inbound toward the solar system, and they find this thing in orbit around it that's growing. Um, seems to be a ship uh, through a bunch of scary, difficult stuff. They figure out there's these creatures inside it, but fundamentally, they are never able to communicate with them because these creatures are not conscious. Um, they're intelligent. They are, they're but intelligent, not conscious. but not. Yeah, it's almost like they're machines. Um, and the big revelation of the book is like, well, is that so different than than us? What is consciousness really? Is it even useful? Um, or is it just sort of a waste of brain processing power? And so, um, yeah, it's a big dark turn. Oh, yeah, and then I guess as long as we're doing spoilers, um, once they realize this, that it's sort of getting increasingly confrontational with these aliens. And um they end up using like their antimatter drive to like self-destruct and kill themselves and this alien spaceship so it won't get to Earth and, and destroy the Earth. Because it's getting and more and more powerful. It's like way more technologically advanced than them if they like let it continue growing. It's basically like a seed. Um, then it's 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 gonna destroy the earth. So. And they've kind of known that's gonna happen all along. The whole point is that Siri, the narrator, is there um because they they think probably there's gonna be some sort of we're going to have to sacrifice ourselves to kill this thing um, because they knew some of the smarter humans, the vampire and the AI knew right away, like what was going on. Um, and so they needed to send Siri back to earth to tell the people of earth in a way that it um, they would understand and it wouldn't get twisted um, by media and by people because the aliens are so different from us that uh, we, that people on earth wouldn't really believe that they were that different. Um, yeah. And I, I just, I, I'm so fascinated by the idea of the, the bifurcation of intelligence and consciousness, because we never, uh, as Peter Watts says in the book, like no one ever questions 
the reason, like the value of consciousness. We, we as humans think of it as the core to being alive. Self-awareness is what being alive is. It's the point. What do you mean? What's the purpose? And he flips that on its head and says, it's actually kind of inefficient, isn't it? If you think about it, we use a lot of, as he says, glucose in our brains, a lot of, a lot of energy thinking about existence instead of just doing existence better. And so we can't communicate with these aliens because they think that language, what, which is indicative of self-consciousness, um, is a virus. And so the, one part of the revelation is that the, the AI has realized long ago um, that we attacked them by showing them language because they view it as a virus um, and that there's no way we could ever communicate with a being that's fundamentally so different. Uh, just what... What yeah, a thing. And the aliens what a are thought. super spooky. They have like these this incredible control over the electromagnetic spectrum and their own bodies. Effectively, their their control of the EM spectrum is so good they can like read human minds just by like reading your brain waves through your skull, basically from a distance, which is incredible. Um, yeah, and I I mean it's the way he lands it and the way he sort of gets at this philosophical idea of like what is consciousness is is the thing we think of of our as our consciousness really in charge of our bodies. Um, right. Also. Yep. It, it just, it makes, it makes it so interesting. I don't think I, I agree with him. Um, I'll say, I think like a lot's, you know, I think we sort of underrate animal intelligence on our own planet and lots of animals I think have sort of like flavors of consciousness. And I think it's sort of a natural part of, of the evolution of ever more intelligent systems. So um, I would say, even if as you're hearing this, you're like, oh, well, I don't know if I buy into that. That doesn't matter. You're still actually going to love the book. It's still like, it's a really interesting idea and presented in such a cool way. Like you don't have to believe this thing in order to find this like a deeply interesting experience, I would say. Yeah, I agree. And also a deeply, like we've said, um, singular one. Uh, what a, just haven't seen first contact ever considered this way. And it, and it makes it all the more believable to me that, uh, it's so foreign to like th this level of um, foreign nature in an alien being, um, something that we couldn't even communicate with at a fundamental level because our uh, experiences and our purposes, whatever, uh, existential way of being are, are just fundamentally different. There's nothing we could do to communicate with them. Um, and I thought, I just think it's so cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's uh, and that's, I think that's also part of why we were saying it was in some ways felt a little similar to, to Xi Jin Lu because it's like similarly, yeah. like if there were aliens like this, like conflict is inevitable because like there is no way to communicate. That's like a, that's a pretty bleak take on, on first contact. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah with the dark forest specifically idea. or that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, dark forest ideas that different i guess i won't spoil it in the this spoiler section but <laughs> anyways um if you've read it you know what i mean um yeah one of one of the best books i've read in a while i absolutely loved blind sight and it sounds like you did too brent yeah i really 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 did i think it was super well done and i loved how much happened in a tight package i mean it's not a short book but it's not too long and given right. how much he's given us here, like it's deeply impressive that it didn't just feel like an overwhelming mess. It really felt like there was a point to everything. The world felt incredibly complicated and interesting and full, but like not too much. You know, it's just, it was the perfect amount of like complexity and philosophical mind bending and, and, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's a very interesting book. I really, really yeah. highly recommend it. If a bit challenging, totally worth the effort. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, I hope uh, uh, if you haven't read it, I hope you do. Hope you love it. And um, yeah, well, I guess we'll see you all in, in two weeks here when we talk with Becky Chambers. We'll go from the, the dark and horror driven to incredibly hopeful and, and fun. <laughs> to kangaroo fuzzy aliens. Yeah. Um, sweet. Well, see you next time. Yeah. Keep reading y'all. Bye. Later. Later.